Welcome back here to watching NTV Weekend Edition with me, Sandra Twinovio, together with Susan Mujawa on the sign language. Now looking at this week's edition of the East African newspaper that reported that the regional legislative assembly members have not been paid since March 2020. We have also previously reported here trouble in Arusha stemming from Burundi and South Sudan's government failing to pay their annual remittances. Consequently, members of the East African Parliament are considering a resolution to compel the two countries. On Talk of the Nation tonight, we are privileged to host Honorable George Stephen Odongo, a member of the East African Legislative Assembly representing Uganda. And of course, he's here to help us understand the issues surrounding the East African community and the like. Welcome to Talk of the Nation tonight. Thank you very much, Susan. Sandra. Sandra. Well, first and foremost, we know that the East African Legislative Assembly is responsible for the budget and also finding solutions to all the issues affecting East African countries. How is the failure by South Sudan and Burundi to pay their annual contributions affecting the, the process? Well, um, <coughs> first of all, the East African community runs a budget of about $100 million dollars of which about 50 percent, precisely about uh, 49 million dollars comes from the partner states. The balance of which, which is over 50 percent, is coming from the donors, is donor funded. Now, so South Sudan and, um, and Burundi, the failure of South Sudan and Burundi to pay their, their, their annual remittances, contributions to the community, and this has, by the way, this has been going on for quite uh, some time now. Uh, for the case of South Sudan, they have areas of about two years or three now. This is the third year running. And for Burundi, um, they have areas of one financial year. That's a substantial amount of money considering the small budget that the community runs. And it affects, of course, it affects the institutions of uh, the community and also the functioning of the organs of the community. So how, um, uh, what are members of the East African Legislative Assembly like yourself doing about uh, such a situation? The community has um, very limited tools in the, its toolbox mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, enforcing compliance. And that's why the Assembly sought to go to the very extreme of citing the provisions of the treaty. Articles 143 and, one, and 146 of the treaty talk about suspension and, um, and even um, expulsion of a member who defaults on their commitments to the community. Now, but, but to trigger off those articles requires that the summit, which is the, the heads of summit, uh, heads of, of, of state of the different partner states, agree on that. It's an elaborate process. But we are interesting the summit, you know, to begin to have a conversation around financing of the community. So by the time we even talk about citing the provisions of the treaty that relate to suspension of a partner, it means that the community is in a very, very desperate situation. And that's what it's experiencing right now. At the moment. Well, let's, let me take you back to the two months without pay. Definitely, it would uh, uh, being not paid for two months would test anyone's patience. Yes. Is there any solution on the horizon at the moment? Well, yes. Um, I think the Council of Ministers, at least by last week when we had a plenary, virtual plenary, the Council of Ministers had uh, initiated uh, a shortcut process of coming up with uh, what they call vote on account. Uh, vote on account is a stopgap measure. However, it was short in terms of um, the legality of it because a vote on account should even be on the basis of a budget that has been considered by Council of Ministers. But the Council of Ministers has not sat in the last um, couple of months to consider budget. Our Budget Act of 2008 provides that by April 30th, a budget of the next financial year should have been presented to the Assembly for consideration. That has not been done. And attempts to have a Council meeting to have a budget discussed have failed. So last week we had uh, Secretary General of the community coming with um, the chair of the Council of Ministers to say as a stopgap measure the Assembly should pass a vote on account which was rejected by the Assembly because it was illegal. You can't pass a vote on account uh, on a budget that has not even been considered by Council of Ministers. It just, 
doesn't go, that's not how a procedure of, of, of work. So they have had to go back. And now I have seen a letter that has been written by the Secretary General uh, indicating that the Council of Ministers will have to sit next week from the 10th uh, to 11. And hopefully they will then discuss this budget and bring it to the Assembly to discuss. But you're talking about a budget for the next financial year. But what we are talking about here is baggage of, of the, the previous, last, of previous the previous years. year. Yeah. So the community is being weighed down by huge areas. And I think there is need to have a broader conversation about alternative financing mechanisms for the community. If we don't delve into that conversation, it doesn't matter how many budgets we pass, we may not be able to sustainably finance the community. Yeah. We have seen this in the last four, five years. The budget of the community has been, you know, the budget performance has been falling from 65, it's now at 60, sometimes it's 59%. And the bulk of the work of the community is through um, donor financing. And donor financing is not sustainable. Uh, and now with this COVID, there's going to be a lot of donor fatigue. So we think that the community needs now to begin to consider alternative financing mechanisms so that we are able to have uh, a sustainable means by which the community can be able, just like what the African Union has done. The okay. African Union has, has, has come up with an alternative financing mechanism and they seem to be doing very well. All right, interesting. But you know we are talking about uh, South Sudan and Burundi, but w I know for a fact that Kenya is the only East African country that has managed to pay their annual contributions. All the other six member states haven't you know, met them. What does this mean to you as a member of the East African Legislative well, Assembly? Well, first of all, we thank Kenya for meeting its uh, obligations to the community for this financial year. But um, that's more of an exception. If you look at broadly the financing of the East African community, all the member states, all the member states, with no exception, have either been paying late or have had some areas. This year, Kenya has done very well because it has paid off all its uh, obligations to the community. But also Uganda has done quite well. If you look at the statistics, you'll see that Uganda has actually paid over 90% of its obligation. There's just a small percentage, which I think it's carried forward from the last financial year. But that shouldn't be the issue really about whether who is paying or who is not paying. The issue here is on aggregate, how is the community performing financially? You know, I, as long as uh, we still have partner states that are grappling with areas that span back three years back, mm -hmm. you're going to have a community that is going to be struggling. Of course, the arguments that have been presented to us as our assembly is that, you know, Burundi is, is struggling with a very bitter uh, sanctions mm -hmm. that date back to 2015. Uh, they are struggling. And we congratulate the Republic of Burundi because in spite of that, they have really attempted to pay as we speak right now. I think they are, they are in areas by about one year. Um, South Sudan is an outlier in this, all, in this whole situation because South Sudan, you know, we hear today they, they are indebted to African Union. Tomorrow they have cleared their debt. Um, we are hoping that they could do the same thing uh, with the East African community. I think there is need really to have a broader conversation beyond just the financing of the community. I think there is need to look at, um, the delve into the whole governance structure of the East African community, the leadership of the East African community, the structure of decision making at the East African community. All these make a contribution to what we are talking about right now, uh, including the financing of the East African community. All those things need to be, to be discussed. You know, so the, the financing is, is only one of those that speaks louder because when there are no finances, then everybody begins to talk about financing of the East African community. But there are other areas that are very, very critical to the, um, to the growth uh, and development of the community, including our own integration agenda that require very, very um, special attention. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, with most of the activities being moved away from Arusha, how do you think it's, it's because of the pandemic? I know the pandemic has equally affected you. How do you think it's going to affect the region's budget? Well, I think that um, the virtual uh, meetings, the virtual conferences, because the bulk of the work of the community is actually 
um, because it's a coordinating, uh, Arusha is basically coordination. And it hosts meetings, you know, it coordinates uh, meetings of the different partner states uh, of the community. Now, by us moving virtually, it has had a significant impact on the budget because then there is not much travel. In fact, in the last financial year, thank God, we as an assembly insisted that we must uh, procure video conferencing facilities in order to cut down on the travel budgets. And that's why you have all the six partner states have video conferencing facilities. Now we are conducting our assembly by virtual means. We sit in Kampala and um, have our, 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 our plenary. And that has had a significant um, impact on lowering the cost of, of, of operations of the, of, 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 of the community, including, um, including the other organs of the community. So the, the council should really pick into that and see whether that can make a um, significant contribution to reducing on the cost of operations of the community. I know per sitting you, uh, the members of, of parliament on, the, on this uh, assembly receive about $160 per sitting. Yes. Do you think moving forward, it, the, there is a, a slight possibility of you uh, continuing with the virtual meetings? Is it a possibility? Is it something that you're likely to look into? It's not even that something because we already in, uh, in, 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 in we, 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 were, we, we as an assembly have, have been looking at how do we continue to operate in the circumstances. And one of the proposals that we have as an assembly come up with is actually to continue to have virtual plenaries. So out of the six plenaries that we have in a year, we are considering having half of those plenaries being conducted virtually so that we don't have to travel. So that is going to have a significant um, reduction in the costs of operation. That is just for the assembly purposes. But also we think that during this budget process, we are going to look at those cost areas that could, could then be cut because there, there is no need uh, for, 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 for travel. You know, because most of the time members uh, and also the um, the, the, the workers of the community, including um, from the partner states, from the ministries in the partner states, they have to move to Arusha. You know, the sectoral committees, whether of finance, the ministers of finance, whether it's the permanent secretaries and so on and so forth, and the heads of institutions, they have to regularly move to Arusha whenever there is a critical decision to be taken. They move to Arusha, Arusha to make that decision. But now we think that with... Um, with the video conferencing facility, they can work while in their different partner states. And that is going to have um, a fairly, um, a fairly good amount of, um, of money saved by the community that can then go into other activities. Well, maybe Honorable to take you back. Do you think, uh, one would wonder, we are having, so, uh, the, the East African community has had uh, financial wars for quite some time. Mm. Do you think it, it is an issue of countries not giving it the priority it deserves or maybe they have different things they're focusing on what is the issue exactly well um, <coughs> I think it's a combination of so many things and that's the reason why my recommendation is that we need to have um, we need to have a very special session in which we begin to rethink the whole idea of how we are pushing our integration agenda there is no doubt whatsoever that this is the best that has happened to East African community. Our integration agenda is very important. But partner states need to begin to think about the bigger picture. You know, I think the, 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 the challenge is that we are thinking big, but we are acting so much in our silos. So the silo mentality is still there. It still does exist in the East African So that our priorities are if I am from Uganda, my priorities are really Uganda. And then the others are residual priorities of the region. I think there is need for that kind of leadership. Again, the, the, the software element of our integration needs to come out very, very strongly. And I think this is where um, we need leadership from people like President Museveni, who really has been uh, the most outstanding uh, leader in the region who talks about integration and practices it. Others, and I don't want to mention names, 
are providing integration lip service. They will speak about it when there is a summit, but when they retire into their different partner states, they completely speak a different language. So there is need, we cannot keep driving the integration with our handbrakes on. We must drive full throttle, and uh, all the tools should be available for us to do that. So the conversation should be, how, are we, how should we rethink this whole idea in the context of our, our, our integration now, where we're having six different partner states. The scope of our, of our integration is increasing. The number of institutions that are required now to drive this integration is increasing, but the budget has remained small. You know, the, 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 the levels of commitment are rem uh, still remain very, very, you know, small. Um, the institutional infrastructure of the community is still very thin, you know, and also we need to look at the structural um, the, the structural arrangement of the community so that it's, it's able to function in a manner that supports our, our, our objective of integration. At the moment, I think we are still in the 1970-80 mode, and yet we are dealing with an integration agenda of the 20th, uh, 20th century. So I think there is need to drive this integration agenda with commitment, uh, with uh, resources, and the leadership that it deserves. Well, I think the key here is leadership. All right, you talk about leadership, and you've also given us quite a number of recommendations, but what do you think is likely to be the next uh, move for the legislative body in order to solve this crisis? Well, um, <coughs> as an assembly, we, you know, our, we are limited. The East African community structure is, is, is such that it's one of the most regulated institutions. Even the assembly itself is, is actually very much limited. Um, the bulk of the powers are with the council of ministers and the summit. So as an assembly, we, are going to con we continue to push the council of ministers to see the urgency of financing the community. Mm. This community, if not handled very well, will collapse under the weight of financial uh, inadequacy. Okay. <laughs> well, we do hope it doesn't get to that. And we hope it doesn't get to that. Yeah, it's my prayer. Mm -hmm. And I really pray that we don't get into that. In a, in a, and by the way, um, I really don't think that having Burundi or South Sudan expelled from the community is an option. It is not because our integration is just beyond the financing of the, 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 the community. But it's a complex web of, 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 of um, a complex web of, um, how could I call it, of drivers mm. to make us realize the dream of East African community. All right. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable, for joining us in our studios tonight to give us a sense of exactly what is happening within the East African community, the financial wars, and everything to do with the members of this assembly not getting paid. We do hope the East, Afri East African countries can come together and resolve the crisis as soon as possible. Thank you all for joining us tonight on Talk of the Nation, and of course, NTV Weekend Edition continues shortly.